Good morning, everyone, and welcome to episode 36 of the On Air Advocate, where at the On Air Advocate, we look to provide education, support, and empowerment for all of those with different abilities, mental and medical illnesses, and their caregivers. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Tammy Flynn, and I'm the host and producer at the On Air Advocate, and I am super excited that you are joining us here this morning on this broadcast or catching it on the replay. Now, we are in a kind of a series of and focus on chronic pain and pain management over the last two weeks now, and we're going to finish up at the end of next week. So with that being said, if you know if this broadcast could be beneficial for anyone that's maybe like dealing with some chronic pain issues or pain management, please hit the share button. Um, now, if they're not on Facebook after this broadcast, this will be made into a YouTube video as well, so you can share it with them that way. So with that being said, I am excited to welcome another amazing guest to the show today that has so much content and good information to share with us in the chronic pain and pain management world. And that is a dear friend of mine, as well as an amazing doctor, Dr. Miller. She is the owner of Miller Sports and Wellness Chiropractic, and I'm just super excited to have you here today. Hi, Tammy. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. And you know, when we started talking, I'm like, you just broke down so many layers of the whole pain management and making sure that you're crossing all your, you know, T's and dotting all your I's. And so I'm just excited for you to share that with our audience. But first, if you could just give us a little bit of a background for the audience watching this morning. Sure. So, um, as Tammy said, I'm a chiropractor by training. So um, I do practice traditional chiropractic with adjusting, but I have a little bit of a unique kind of perspective on chiropractic. Um, to make a really long story short, I was a competitive athlete and I had 16 major injuries over the course of my gymnastics career, competing all the way through college. And at the end of that career, I knew I wanted to go into medicine and I was facing a hip surgery and my orthopedic surgeon said, you need the surgery, but I think this chiropractor can get you through the rest of the season go see them. The mm -hmm. chiropractor started working on my feet and my initial, it was my first experience with chiropractic. And my first reaction was, why are you working on my feet when I have a hip problem that we know is a problem and needs surgery? And he convinced me to give him two visits to see if it changed my pain. And it completely transformed my pain. And what had happened was because of my previous injuries, my ankles weren't working properly and they were causing my hip to pick up more force. And that's how I got started in chiropractic. So it has really led me down a path to really strive at getting at the root of the problem. Sometimes the problem isn't where the pain is. And that's where I kind of think I have a unique perspective on chronic pain is a lot of times we get so focused on where the pain actually is. Mm -hmm. We don't treat the underlying cause. And if you don't treat the underlying mm -hmm. cause, it's difficult to get rid of the entire problem. So that's kind of where my focus is. I use a lot of different techniques factored in with chiropractic adjusting. So we're going to talk about some of those techniques today that I think can really help people um, coordinate in with the methods that they're already using to maybe make a difference in what they're experiencing. That's wonderful. So where do we start? <laughs> All right. So one of the things that I really wanted to touch on was developing a comprehensive care plan. So one of the things that happens in medicine is medicine has become so specialized. We've learned so much about the human body and there's still so much to learn. But every doctor knows a lot about one piece of the puzzle. And what happens is from the patient's perspective, I have foot pain and it's really bad foot pain. Well, who do I see? Do I see a podiatrist? Do I see a PT? Do I see an orthopedic surgeon? Do I see my general care practitioner? And each of those has a certain toolbox and a certain knowledge base that they're wonderful at. But if we don't all work together and coordinate care and dig into each of our toolboxes for each unique case, we miss a big piece of the pie. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is coordination of care. No matter where you start, it doesn't matter if you start with your, your orthopedic or you start with your um, pain management doctor, you start with your primary care doc, no matter where you start, you as the patient have to understand a little bit about kind of what's going on with your case and advocate for yourself that you're pulling in different pieces of the puzzle. Every piece you go to should make a measurable change in a relatively short amount of time. So for example, if a patient comes into me and we get started um, and it doesn't matter what it is, headaches, back pain, foot pain, doesn't matter. Within two to three visits, we should see a measurable change. 
Now, maybe that's a change in their pain. Maybe that's a change in their ability to do activities during the day. Well, I couldn't lift my laundry basket, but now I can. Or I couldn't sit on a swing and play with my child, but now I can. There should be a measurable change. And if there's not, either you need to change techniques or you need to try to get coordination across multiple different disciplines so that you're dipping into different tools within a toolbox. And that doesn't mean that within a few visits it's gonna be fixed, mm -hmm. but it means that there should be a change. So if it's not, you know, if you're moving in the right direction, then you keep going that way. And right. if you're not, then you need to step back mm -hmm. and take a look at what other tools might be out there. So right. let's talk a little bit about how to coordinate care. Um, and then we'll get into some techniques that I think are helpful. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you can do as a patient is when you're seeing a provider, express to that provider that you really want to try to treat this from multiple different angles and ask them to explain risks and benefits and alternatives to the care that they're giving. A lot of times um, doctors always have kind of a plan A, plan B, plan C mm -hmm. kind of in mind, but we don't always express that to the patient because it's overwhelming. So you as a patient, bring a notepad, tell them that you want to approach this from multiple different angles and you want to explore different options and have them kind of give you what is that plan A, what is that plan B, and what is that plan C, and ask them to help you coordinate that care with another provider or with somebody else in their office that might be able to utilize those techniques. If you express that to them up front, they're more likely to explain those, um, those different pathways and then you can ask them for what's called a narrative report. A narrative report is a brief summary of what they found and what you talked about in your visit. And you can take that in hand to any other provider that gets put into that care plan. So if they say, well, let's use PT and let's use chiropractic and let's use this pain medication. Well, now the PT, the chiropractor and them, all of you are on the same page with that narrative report in hand, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's a really important factor for patients to realize and to be able to advocate for themselves. And most providers are very, very willing to do that. Right. It's just, we all get busy. And so the patients that really want that extra support or need that extra support, if you ask for it, it's nice and easy for us to coordinate care that way. It's all about using your voice. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. And if the provider doesn't know that that's something you're interested in or something that you would find valuable, um, or maybe you're just frustrated because you feel like, you know, I've been taking this medication and I'm not getting better, or I've been doing my exercises that the PT gave me, but I don't feel like it's changing. If you have frustration and you express that to the provider, they're not going to take offense. Right. It, it gives them information to say, you know what, what we're doing isn't working. Let's find you another tool and let's work together within our toolboxes instead of batting heads and, and competing for the patient, let's work together and help the patient out. Right. So you actually get some comprehensive answers that you're looking for instead of continually going. And I think, you know, you saying that gives so much power and validation to the patient because so many times the patient feels like they don't always have the right to stand up and ask for those things, but you do. And honestly, like anything in life, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And so <laughs> the more you ask, the more you will receive. Um, I even say when it comes to terminology and all of that, stop your providers, stop your doctors and say, I'm not really understanding where you're coming at with this. Because that's the only way as an advocate for yourself that you learn what the doctor, what they're trying to say, because you didn't go to medical school. You don't know Absolutely. all the lingo, even a narrative, you know, when you're thinking about a narrative, if you're not explaining that that's a summary, how would you know that that's for sure what that is? You know, because we have words for everything in the medical field. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you and know, one of the things that I tell patients is ask for an analogy. So mm -hmm. a lot of times patients are, you know, I'm trying to explain something to them and they're not really getting it. And so one of the things I say is, you know what, let's use an analogy. Let me explain this in terms of a train and then, and then the patient can relate to that a little bit better. And you're not using medical terminology, but at least you understand the concept. Right. And you can always come back later and say, okay, now give me the full spiel now that I understand the basis. So that's right. another trick too, is if your provider's kind of confusing you because they're talking in mm -hmm. lingo that you don't understand, stop them and say, can you use an analogy to explain this to me? And a lot of times providers have one in their back pocket. They just have to pull it out and that can help too. 
Right. And also some of those visuals, which I know you're going to get into some visual aids later, but I think that there are many people who auditorily take in so much, but so many people do visually. So when they can see a picture of kind of what's going on in, you know, with the human body and looking at that or looking at their spine or their hips or whatever helps them to break that process down in their head. Oh, I get it. This is connected to this and this is to this. And and that's why I'm having these, these feelings. So I think that's so important. I'm so glad that you're talking about this because so many patients, you know, need to know that they can use their voice and they can ask all these questions and doctors aren't going to take offense to it. You know, they're, if they're a good doctor, they're going to be happy that you're asking questions. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the really cool things happening in medicine is we are seeing a lot more integrative care where Mm -hmm. it used to be that PTs and chiropractors fought all the time. Now we're seeing we work together much more. Same thing with MDs and chiropractors and PTs and DOs. And you have all these different specialties that used to really compete and butt heads. And, um, you know, nobody really recognized the validation of each of the different professions. And it's really cool to see, you know, I have orthopedics that I basically have on speed dial where I can call and say, Hey, I have a complicated case. What do you think about this? Can I send them to you? And they send me patients back and I send to PTs. And so that's the other thing from a patient standpoint is I have a lot of patients that still are afraid to tell their primary care doc that they're seeing a chiropractor. And most of the time it's don't be afraid to tell them they need that information. They need to understand what other tools you're using and not just chiropractic, but acupuncture, massage, um, homeopathy, herbal treatments. I mean, there's so many things out there. Diet modifications, all of that. Right. Yeah. And so don't be afraid to tell your providers if they're a good provider and they're listening to you as the patient, which most of them are, Mm -hmm. they're going to, they're going to want that information and then they can help you develop a more comprehensive plan instead of Mm -hmm. hiding pieces of the puzzle. And then we can't put things together appropriately. Right. Right. That is, that's wonderful. So that you had the individualized plans, kind of that, that falls under the comprehensive care plans as well, the yes. coordination of care. Um, and then you, you were talking a little bit about the, like looking at the whole person aspects, mm-hmm. you know, the whole body aspect. So I'm not sure what the next layer is to this. Yes. So um, in my realm, I kind of focus on sports medicine and um, biomechanics. So mm-hmm. I see, you know, Medicare patients, all um, I see weekend golfers and I see elite athletes that are training for the Olympics. I kind of see the whole gamut, mm-hmm. but when we're talking about chronic pain, one of the things that often happens is we, is we look at where the pain is, but not at where the pain is coming from. And I kind of hinted at that with my, with my background. So, um, one of the things that I really emphasize is if you're dealing with musculoskeletal pain, that's hip pain, ankle pain, knee pain, back pain, um, even headaches, finding somebody in your community that really kind of specializes in biomechanics and evaluating that. So what we do is we bring you in and we do uh, look at how you move and those movement strategies and how they put different loads. So for example, every time you get up and down out of a chair, it's kind of like a squat. So we might watch you squat and see, are you overusing your back or are you loading your knees inappropriately? Or are you doing different biomechanical alterations that are putting excess load on different places? So for example, if you're getting up and down out of your chair by dropping your shoulders forward, leaning forward and and using momentum to get yourself up, Mm -hmm. your back is likely getting really sore or getting overloaded because you're not using your hips properly. So I can treat your back all day long, but if I don't get your hips to function properly, we miss the boat, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a couple techniques that I use in my office. One is called um, functional movement systems or FMS and Selective Functional Movement Assessment, or SFMA. Mm -hmm. And those techniques um, are really helpful at kind of identifying some underlying issues or underlying causes in the body. So one of the things that happens is um, when we look at kind of medicine in general, you come into the office and insurance carriers often will only pay for treatment at an area where the pain is unless we can objectively identify where else it's coming from. So having some somebody that has that toolkit or that ability to kind of objectively show, hey, there is pain at the back and we're going to treat that, but let's get rid of this hip dysfunction or this other thing that's going on so that we can improve the patient's way of moving and that they don't have to be back in my office next month with the same problem. Right. So doing that biomechanical assessment, um, more than just looking at this site of pain is really important. It doesn't mean we're going to ignore the pain, 
but we have to make sure that we look at the whole picture. Then once we gather that information, then we can say, okay, I watch you squat and you're using your hips improperly, just as an, as an example to follow that through. If you're using hips improperly, then I should be able to provide some sort of treatment. Maybe that's using a tissue treatment because your hips don't have the mobility that they need. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Okay. Or maybe um, we should do some exercises to strengthen the hips. Um, and we can talk about different techniques for that as well. But whatever side of the puzzle that is, if I do a tissue treatment on the hips, I should be able to watch you squat again and I should see a change. Right. And maybe that change sticks around. Or maybe we have to do some more training and help you learn how to move better. Mm -hmm. But there should be a noticeable change right away, even within you know, within that visit where the patient can say, wow, that feels different, or that takes pain out of my back, or that feels completely different than how I've been moving. And then we can carry that through. So let's talk a little bit about some of these techniques, because I think this can be really helpful for people. Okay. Um, on the tissue side, so if um, we're lacking mobility, your tissues aren't moving properly. One of the techniques that I really like is called active release technique. Um, it's a hands-on technique where we have the patient kind of moving through different motions. But what's cool about it is we can actually palpate or feel how the tissues move through different motions. And the patient can usually feel if something's getting stuck or pulled or tugged mm -hmm. as well. And then we can lay the patient down or sit the patient down, depending on how we have to treat, go through the treatment. It's relatively comfortable. And then we have them get back up and move. And we should feel and see and notice a change right away. And what's cool about the technique is we usually get long-term effects with it. So it can help control pain from the hands-on um, movement that we give the tissues, mm -hmm. but it also helps um, really change the function of the tissues and get those tissues to move and glide the way that they're supposed to. And that helps the patient long-term without having to come back time after time after time after time. Okay. Um, so active release technique is one that I really like to put in there. And is that only, is that active release technique, is that something that only a chiropractor does or an MD does or a massage therapist does? I mean, who, who does that type of technique when people- You have to have a license that allows soft tissue techniques. So that can be a chiropractor, that can be an athletic trainer, not a personal trainer, an athletic trainer. Okay. Um, that can be a massage therapist, that can be a PT, that can be an occupational therapist, it can be an MD, or it can be a DO, okay. uh, a doctor of osteopathic medicine. So any of those can have the certification, and it's additional certification that everybody has to do. So most of those um, uh, designations or degrees get some exposure to it in school, but okay. you have to go on and do pretty rigorous training extracurricularly okay. to get that. All right, perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, so that's one of the biggies that I really like. Um, another kind of umbrella of techniques that I like is what we call instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization. So we shorten that to ISTEM. There's a lot of techniques that fall under that umbrella, mm -hmm. but ultimately, um, I brought one of my tools. Um, ultimately, we use kind of a tool to, we put some oil on the, along the skin and we use the tool to basically scrape through the tissue which sounds meaner than it is. Um, but what we're trying to do is we're stimulating some of the sensors right underneath the surface of the skin. So in a chronic pain patient, when you become really sensitized to pain, you have pain all the time, mm -hmm. your brain focuses on that pain and it learns about pain. And so as that process happens, we can utilize this technique to kind of uh, I don't want to say trick the brain into paying attention to something different, but by stimulating the surface of the skin, we can actually get the body to pay attention to that stimuli and block some of the pain that the patient's been feeling. And then we can stimulate a healing response that speeds up the healing process. So let me take a second. I want to show some visuals here that I think will make a little bit more sense. So I'm going to share my screen. That's awesome. I love sharing the screen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's kind of a, con a, a difficult concept to understand, so let me do this really quick. So here on the screen, I have a picture of a neuron. Um, and just to basically help you understand, here at the bottom, you can see these little tendrils. These mm -hmm. are um, near the surface of the skin, or they might be in different joints, or they might be in all the different tissues that can generate pain. Okay. And so this is a nerve cell. And these little tendrils sit out toward 
the extremity or out toward wherever the pain would be. So let's say in your fingers and your toes and your knee and your hip, wherever. When they get stimulated with pain, they send the signal up what we call the axon, which is this long tube to the cell body, which is located in your spinal cord, okay? Um, and that signal transmits into the spinal cord and then it jumps from these dendrites to the next cell, the next nerve cell, and it transmits again from the tendrils that interconnect all the way up through to the next cell body that's in the brain. So pain gets transferred, if we look at just kind of a really basic human body, let's say you have foot pain, you get the stimuli here, it stimulates those little tendrils, it goes up through the axon to the cell body here at the spinal cord, it makes its jump from here at the spinal cord up to the brain, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, when you um, get up in the morning and you <laughs> put your watch on, you first feel your watch, and then over time, you no longer feel it anymore, right? Your mm -hmm. body kind of adapts to it. Yeah. Um, well, what happens is if your foot is in pain, your body is sending signal after signal after signal after signal, and that pathway is getting used and used and used and used, and so your body actually adapts, and instead of ignoring it, it kind of studies it and it learns it and it strengthens that pathway. So by using these, <clears throat> these ISTEM tools or several other techniques that we can talk about as well, by using these tools, we can actually get the brain to pay attention to the stimuli that's happening on the surface of the tissue. And that changeover of feeling that stimuli allows the body to pay attention to that instead of to the pain. If that helps. So kind of like reprogramming the, the brain as to the way yes. we're, what we're yes. thinking. Yes, absolutely. And then at the same time, through that technique, we're also bringing in blood flow. And with blood flow comes proteins, nutrients, enzymes, everything that we need for healing. So mm -hmm. at the same time, we're also bringing in all those, all those healing mechanisms to speed up the healing process. So that's a really great tool or technique, especially if we have a patient that can't move very well. Mm -hmm. um, ART or active release technique is an active technique. We have to be able to move the patient. Okay. In a patient that <clears throat> maybe you're in really severe pain and you can't get up and down off the table very easily, or um, you've been in pain for so long you're in a wheelchair or you know something like that, or you have other multiple different conditions going on, we can utilize that tool without needing to move you or shift you or shake you or change anything. Okay. Um, and we can work to your tolerance. And so it's a great tool or technique that we can use with chronic pain as well. Okay, to help that reprogramming, mm -hmm. to help that happen. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so obviously being a chiropractor by training, let's talk about chiropractic and adjusting a little bit as well. Um, personally, I don't often use adjusting without pairing it with other techniques. That's my personal opinion. You will, I mean, there are chiropractors that treat like that. There are chiropractors that treat very differently. But my personal philosophy is just that you know, with the adjustment, we're affecting the joints and the bones and the, the neurology of the system. We'll talk about that in a second. But we also want to affect the soft tissues um, and that kind of thing. We also want to make sure that there's enough strength and stability around the joints. We might use rehab. So we kind of dig into these different little pockets depending on what's going on with the patient. But as far as an adjustment goes, adjusting is essentially creating movement where movement is lacking. So in a joint that hasn't moved in a really long time because a patient has been in pain and has been guarded. Or um, maybe it has just kind of gotten stuck because of the different postures and positions that we sit in or we, or we live in all day long. But essentially what we do is we identify which segment is not moving or which joint is not moving, and we create motion where there is motion lacking. And when we do that, um, remember I showed the pictures of the nerves and how they kind of transmit. So there are nerves inside each and every one of our joints called proprioceptors, and they transmit information just like those pain cells. So the little tendril sense, it goes up the axon, it synapses in the spinal cord, and it goes on up. So what we can do is by opening and closing a joint really quickly, by utilizing an adjustment, there's a lot of different techniques, by opening and closing that joint quickly, we send a barrage of information into those little tendrils, and those little tendrils fire and they send their signal up through that pathway that we talked about up to the brain. Okay. Okay. So by opening and closing that joint and sending that barrage of information, we're able to basically reset that, that motor unit pathway or that, um, 
that neurologic pathway and actually control pain, control muscle spasm. Um, there's a lot that we can do with that adjustment to help normalize tissues and painful stimuli and reset kind of that, that pathway that we've been talking about. So it's kind of a great piece that we can add in. Now there are tons of different techniques. We can use our hands, we can use different little instruments. Um, so what's important is that when the patient comes in, we take a really thorough history. We identify if you're a good candidate for adjusting, and some people aren't. There are reasons we don't adjust. Um, so we identify if you're a good candidate, and then we also identify which technique is best. If you have severe osteoporosis and your bones are really weak, we're gonna use a different technique than if you're really strong and robust and you're a bodybuilder. So we've got that ability to kind of shift and change and use different techniques depending on what's going on. Okay. That, that's like, I feel like I should have had a notebook. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a lot of information. It is. <laughs> but it's so good and it's so good to know how thorough and how many options, how thorough you are and how many options are out there and really how you have to look at those different modalities and make sure that you are with a physician that is going to look at that whole picture so that you're not utilizing some of the wrong techniques that ultimately could possibly hurt you more than benefit Absolutely. you, you know, in any way that way. So Absolutely. no, and I, I think, think that's it's so great. The important to tell patients is if your provider only has one tool or one technique, that's okay. That means that they're an expert. They are great at that one technique, mm -hmm. but if you can find somebody who has a lot of different techniques, or if your provider who only has one technique openly works with lots of different techniques, that mm -hmm. is kind of the best of all worlds because, um, you know, I'll admit I am, I like lots of different techniques. And so I've got lots of different tools I can dig into, but in a, in a case where I say, you know what, I really think, you know, this technique is ideal for you and I dabble mm -hmm. in it, but so-and-so is the expert in it. Let's send you over mm -hmm. there. But knowing what else is out there is kind of important and making sure that you can, you can dig into these different tools depending on what's going on. Right, right. And refer people out to the right, you know, to the right people, to the right yeah. doctors and the right different um, therapies and whatnot. Yeah. Um, now, I know you had, where are we on your list? I had a whole list of things we were going to go through. I know, I know. Um, well, I mean, I've covered a lot of the big points that I kind of wanted to... Mm -hmm wanted to talk about. Um, I don't know if there's anything in particular that you kind of had questions about or... No, but I think it's our, wrapping back know. to the fact of pa patients being great advocates for themselves, or mm -hmm. if this is for your child or your loved one, making sure you're doing your research, making sure you're asking questions, and always knowing that, you know, when we provide information here on the Honor Advocate, it is ideas. It's giving you resources. It's giving you things to think about. It doesn't mean that it's going to be the perfect fit for everyone. Um, but in exploring our health, you know, and especially when you have chronic conditions, you kind of have to leave no stone unturned and, and try things and, you know, give phases of them and see if they work. Um, now, how do you feel about, I know this week we talked a ton about journaling and when we start new treatments, seeing that sort of progress, is it working effectively? Um, should I add anything more to it? Do you do anything with your patients that way where you guys kind of on a daily basis look at, you know, their, what they're eating for food, what they're doing for activity and, and that sort of thing? Do you give them any type of a tool that way when they come into the office to kind of track what their normal is on a daily basis? Absolutely. Um, so we use tools in office um, called objective measures, where we actually have patients fill out questionnaires asking them about how much pain do you have when you do X, Y, or Z, and it depends on where they have pain or, you know, that kind of thing. So we use tools in the office. For the patient, um, I often use pain journaling. And one of the things that I tell patients is we want to be able to track pain, but we, we also want to be able to track function because pain is a piece of the puzzle, but you know, it's not the only piece. So you also want to be able to pay attention to maybe you're still in pain, but at the start of this, you couldn't climb the stairs to go up to your daughter's bedroom because you were in so much pain and your knee hurt. Right. But now at the end, you're still in pain, but now you can do much more before that pain is brought up. So we kind of pick, I tell patients, pick one or two factors to try to pay attention 
attention to. Mm-hmm. And then don't, don't over focus on it. So once a day, sit down and make your little note, but don't, don't get overly bogged down with, okay, every three hours I have to make a note and I have to look at all of these different factors. If we feel that diet is an important piece, maybe it's looking at your diet and your pain. If we feel that your sleep or your stress is the factor, let's look at sleep or stress and pain. And then we can change that over the course of time. So what I kind of tell them is, let's think of this as kind of like a little science experiment. We don't want to change too many variables at once. Right. Let's pick one or two. Let's see, let's watch the progress of that for a week or maybe two. Um, Let's watch the progress of that. And then let's change one or two other factors. Excuse me, and see kind of where this goes from there. But I think journaling can be really important. Um, Just taking a moment to kind of mindful meditation and and sit down and be happy and grateful for the things that you do have in your life um, can often help you just kind of reset and distance you from the pain a little bit. Um, So I often talk to my patients about meditation or um, decreasing stress journaling, all of that kind of stuff to help us track. Right. Cause that helps with the whole mindset thing and taking you away. And I, I talked to multiple different people last weekend at the beginning of this week about that, how, you know, some of those other um, modalities and homeopathic remedies and whatnot really can be so helpful to the mind to take the mind to a different place during those periods of heavy chronic pain, or if it's on a daily you know, basis for that. Um, that is, that's so good that all this information is so wonderful. Now the kind of in wrapping up outside of yourself. Okay. Cause you're here in, in Wisconsin. Okay. Mm-hmm. You're a chiropractic here in Wisconsin. Um, are there in your own resources for your own clinic, if there are people that are viewing this that are outside of the state of Wisconsin, do you have, um, a, a regular a blog or something that they can read or keep up with you, or if they had questions, and even if they don't live here, they would be able to throw them at you. Where can they find you to do those sort of things? Absolutely. So um, my website is Miller S W C for Sports Wellness Chiropractic dot com, and on there we've got a blog. I write at least one a month, and often more. Um, and I've got eight years of blogs that you can look back at. Um, that gives a lot of information. I really do a lot of education with patients. So a lot of them educate on different techniques or different things like that. And I always cite where you can get more information. So for example, if you want to learn more about ART or active release technique, go to my blog, you can search at the top corner um, and you can look up active release technique or ISTIM, instrument assisted soft tissue. And I have links in there to where can you find certified providers in your area? Or what questions might you want to ask if you're interviewing a provider to see if their techniques might fit with yours. Um, I have a lot of that education material on my site. (laughs) Um, In terms of finding, you know, a good chiropractor that might be able to fit into your puzzle, the American Chiropractic Association has providers listed on their website. um, And they really, they really push for evidence-based providers Um, providers that mix well with the medical profession. So the ACA is a great resource um, to kind of learn more about chiropractic itself, but find a provider in your area. Um, Same thing, activerelease.com has uh, certified providers all around the U.S. and actually internationally. Um, So those all give kind of some good resources to get started. Okay. And on the end of products, is there any one product um, that you personally you love um, that, you know, for chronic pain that you have found that has worked. Um, Yesterday when we were talking to um, the amazing 19-year-old Allie who lives with chronic pain, she is just a rock star. She was telling us about her hot booties, how they have saved her so many times from her chronic pain, some stuff with essential oils. But I feel like everyone that's in the the pain world, we have different things that we we love to use. So Mm -hmm. is there anything that's a favorite? Um, yeah, so I would say um, probably one of my favorite products. Actually, I have I have them right here. Oh, um, <laughs> you're ready. I, yeah, I had all my stuff pulled out in case. Um, <laughs> are something called yoga tune-up balls. Um, so they are they come in different sizes, and this one is kind of a two-pack and a ball. Um, but what I love about these, and you can use a lacrosse ball if if you just buy one from the sporting goods store to kind of get started. These mm-hmm. offer a little bit more 
they're designed for tissue work, so they're going to be a little bit more forgiving than that lacrosse ball. Um, but these guys, what I love about them is they're really simple. So if you have an area of pain, um, we kind of talked about that iostim. This is a way that you can stimulate those cutaneous receptors at home and mobilize the fascia, the muscles, the tissue kind of in the area. So let's just say, because of camera, I have hand pain. Um, I can take my ball and I can use it to kind of essentially massage into the area. These guys are designed to be able to grip the tissue and actually, if you can kind of see my arm, they actually kind of mobilize the tissue. You can see my tissue kind of twisting. Mm -hmm. So I can get in here and I can rub, I can twist, but I can basically kind of massage or work the area. And different from your fingers, these guys mobilize the tissue and it kind of creates that same pain gating that we talked about with my little diagrams. Okay. It blocks the pain and it distracts the pain and it can give some really good, um, you know, short-term and even long-term results for a patient. So when you're in a ton of pain, mm -hmm. you can get in there and self-treat at home and they're simple. And that's what I love about them. Awesome. And I'm going to get that name so that below this um, live, I can drop a link so people can look those up and kind of sure. you know, read about them and all, of, and all of that. So that is Fabulous, fabulous. More tools, more tools than the toolbox. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And in closing, is there anything that you would like to leave us with today on this thoughtful and thankful Thursday? Um, I think the biggest thing is just no matter what you're dealing with, mm -hmm. um, you know, chronic pain can be such a debilitating aspect of your daily life. And especially in the face of the opiate epidemic that we've got going on and, um, you know, pain medications and all that kind of stuff. It can be so debilitating. So just to be really grateful for the things that you do have mm -hmm. um, and try to work with your, with your providers to create that comprehensive plan. And hopefully through all of that, you can find some relief and make some changes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that is great. That's great. So I thank you guys all for tuning in this morning and hanging with me and Dr. Miller for the last 40 minutes plus. Um, if you guys want to check out any of our other podcasts, YouTube tutorial videos, any of that, you can go to www.onairadvocate.com and you can find all of those right there. Um, Dr. Miller's segment, like I said, will be up on our YouTube channel in just the next you know, day or so. So make sure if you know that it's relevant for anybody to share the information. Tune in tomorrow. We have our favorite pharmacist from Georgia. She's going to be on breaking down all of our opiate crisis drugs when you're going to the, the pharmacy and how we get mad at our pharmacists. Don't get mad at your pharmacist because they do care. <laughs> People like to do that. Um, so on that note, you guys all have a wonderful Thursday. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Bye-bye. Have a great day, guys. Bye.